Feminism in Okinawa. All right, so please join me in welcoming Tracy and Stan. Well, we want to say um, thank you so much for coming. Um, we could be doing many other things at 12 noon, I'm sure, but, um, but we really appreciate this opportunity to share a little bit. Um, maybe we'll say a little bit about ourselves, and um, uh, and, and then we'll just uh, go. Um, so, of course, thank you to Kimberly Tengla, who choreographs, coordinates, facilitates, <laughs> well, cozy. If, if, if Kimberly, and I, I probably should acknowledge the team that also works with you, if we didn't do this, we wouldn't even have this space for conversation. Um, I also want to thank um, the college's um, International Professional Development Grant Fund. And so those of you who are employees here know that it's possible uh, to, to be supported to attend a delegation um, like this. Um, I absolutely, I'm seeing a few uh, students from my class, I really appreciate them having let me go because truly that itself was also a gift. And, um, and then I also want to thank our sponsoring um, organization, which is called the Asian Pacific American Labor Alliance. If you've not heard of APALA, um, that logo kind of helps to suggest that it's a coming together of both the um, Labor Federation, AFL, CIO, with um, supporting um, Asian and Pacific Islander uh, trade unionists to um, to organize um, together and to develop new generations of organizers and to build relationships between the labor movement and Asian Pacific Islander communities. So my union is American Federation of Teachers and? Yeah, so my union is the Washington State uh, Nurse, Nurse, Nurses Association, WSNA. Which actually at this time happens to be under uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, American Federation of Teachers of, of Washington State, um, and that's a different story, but if for some reason you're interested in how do all these unions fit together, uh, we can talk about that at another point. Um, Apala uh, definitely gave me an opportunity to develop as a, um, I hesitate saying this because it sounds too fancy, but to be more of a labor leader, but really what that means is feeling confident to um, represent my colleagues um, in union situations. That means knowing deeply what our contract is about so that if there are violations, um, don't want to think of my colleagues that way, but it's happened, um, that we know how to protect each other and to stand up for ourselves. And I really am grateful to Apollo for having given me a lot of opportunities to sort of realize that because um, there actually aren't that many Asian or Pacific Islander uh, faculty in this big group of a thousand in the Seattle Colleges District. Um, so it kind of took some doing to really kind of come forward a little bit. Yeah. So um, maybe we can say, um, I guess, well, just a, a little more background before we explain um, why would we even start with the Battle of Okinawa so long ago. Um, so Apala had had uh, communications and exchanges with peace and labor activists in Okinawa and actually in Tokyo as well. So Apala has a, a national gathering every two years and since at least 2015, delegations from Okinawa and Tokyo have been coming to those gatherings for the reason that they hope and they believe that in the United States, um, union members like ourselves, when we learn more about what their issues are, that we could help to communicate that to the broader American labor movement and the U.S. public at large. And so um, Apollo had not sent a delegation to Okinawa or Tokyo previously, and this fall was sort of that first opportunity, partly because one of the uh, Japanese um, labor activists um, had passed away somewhat suddenly um, earlier in the year, and they, we kind of wanted to um, honor his legacy because he'd been uh, so strongly working on kind of bringing this kind of exchange together. So um, that's just a, a little bit about um, why and how that even came about. 
so if we were there from October 17th or so to the 27th, we spent most of the time in Naha, in Okinawa, and then we spent maybe four days, three, four days, in, in Tokyo, and um, we don't have so many slides that go with that part, but uh, um, that was, we just learned a, a tremendous, tremendous amount. Um, do you want to add anything else yet? Uh, well, just to go back to, to say that actually Tracy is a, a labor leader. She's <laughs> on the National Committee of AFT, Civil Rights Committee of AFT. Uh, she goes back to D.C. for the uh, MLK uh, <clears throat> celebration. She's also on the National Board of the Apollo itself. So, um, nationally connected. I'm just local. I'm just, I, was, I was a unit rep on, when I worked in the hospital on the floor. Um, but also I'm, active in the community. I, I'm more active in the community with the Sudu for Solidarity, with uh, Japanese American Citizens League, with Julia Lake Pilgrimage Committee, with Nisei Veterans Foundation, um, among other things from Hiroshima to hold so a lot of different so um, the reason I, I started here, and I apologize if the image is just a little too triggering because war is always going to be triggering. Sadly, there's just way too much of it. Okay, personal commentary. But um, when we went, the first thing that our hosts had to say to us is, we need you to know what happened during that battle and how over a quarter of Okinawan civilians died, even though they weren't actively fighting against the Marines who, you know, had, had, um, had initiated this, this uh, exchange. Um, and of course, in the context of World War II, uh, Japan and the U.S. were definitely on opposite sides. Um, but I think one of the points that they made to us that completely, uh, well, made me wonder why, why this was lacking in my own history training, you know, all those classes I took and how come I never learned that after the Marines had secured Okinawa as the southern prefecture of Japan, they rounded up all the Okinawans and put them in concentration camps. And they didn't let them go even at the end of the war because that moment was used to build bases and airstrips, and so on. And so when Okinawans were released from those concentration camps, they couldn't actually go back home because home was now occupied. And you know, both of us, especially Stan, whose family was incarcerated in concentration camps during World War II, we couldn't help but notice that this is going on at the same time that these concentration camps in the United States were still open. Because the last one doesn't even close. Tule Lake does not close until the summer of 1946. 46. And in case you're like, yeah, when did World War II, when would be the official ending? It's in the summer of 45. Whew. So that was, that was a lot to think about. As well, our hosts reminded us that Okinawans still felt occupied by Japanese mainlanders because that annexation had taken place in 1879. And generationally, this was still very present. You know, I know looking among you and some of you quite young, and it probably is like, seriously? 1879? Move on! But generationally, it's still, still very fresh. And how these things become more layered is all those bases that the U.S. is maintaining in Okinawa, that part of the surrender of Japan was to continue paying for that. And so, I don't know if U.S. tax dollars, Japanese tax dollars at work is something that you can kind of go, oh, that's how this is being funded, including the very controversial new base, which we so that's kind of why I wanted to start there. Do you want to say more? Yeah, so at the, the Battle of Okinawa, you can just look at the dates, April 1 through June 22nd. It lasted nearly three months, so about 80-some days. 
of actual combat fighting on a pretty small island. Um, it's like if you had constant combat uh, between Tacoma and Everett for 90 days. Um, and loss of life was horrendous. There were about 14,000, 15,000 U.S. troops that died in that battle. There were over 100,000 Japanese troops that died in that battle. And there were over 125,000 Okinawan civilians who died in that battle. So they really took the brunt of it. Um, and that was 125,000 out of about 400,000 population at the time. So it, it, it was huge. So, and it totally devastated the island. Um, everything got totally bombed out. So, um, and uh, like you were saying, the occupation continued after the war. And Okinawa did not revert back to Japan until 1972. So, and a lot of Okinawans feel like, so we were officially occupied from the end of World War II until 1972. And we are still occupied because we still have all these U.S. bases um, taking over much of the island uh, up to this day and actually they're expanding. So um, I don't know if this was the best image to choose, but I, I, out of respect for our hosts, I wanted to just kind of do a few other reminders that so um, Okinawan language is actually quite distinct. It is not just somehow a subordinate dialect to Japanese language. It's just, it is different, period. Um, and definitely cultural practices reflect other kinds of interactions because the Yuku uh, kingdom um, was, uh, was developing itself, um, you know, over probably about four centuries. So, you know, a significant long period of time um, they had independent and sovereign relations with all the other countries in the region, um, and um, you know, and, and this got completely um, uh, subordinated once they were annexed um, by Japan, and, and all the things that go along with those kinds of occupations. You know, um, Japan becomes the dominant language; it's being taught in schools. People are forced to take different kinds of names. Um, punishments, um, you've probably read about that in so many other situations. Indian boarding schools, a topic that my students have to be studying. In a U.S. history class, you know, children being punished for trying to speak in their own languages. And same thing, Okinawan children being punished. Um, anyway, these are, uh, if you know anything about drumming, this is really distinct. Okinawan drums are quite distinct, the way they hold the rhythms, the costumes that they wear. So that was just a way to try to. Um, want to talk about the peace? Yeah, so <clears throat> the Okinawa prefectural government decided to uh, make a peace memorial park at the site of one of the landing areas where the Marines, US Marines first came onto the island did the landing. So it's on this, uh, actually it's on a uh, plateau or uh, a, uh, promontory above the beaches where the landings took place. And you can look down and see it. Um, the photo on the right is basically a map of Japan and Okinawa. And the, the light blue is the water and the dark blue is the uh, main part of Asia. Uh, and it has little arrows to show its relationship to a number of different countries, not just Japan. Uh, which emphasizes that it was a real hub of trade and relation, intergovernmental as well as uh, social and cultural relations um, for centuries. Because it's about equally distant from China, Korea, as it is to Japan, and it's also not much further to the Philippines or Vietnam. So there was a lot of circulating in all those countries. On the left, you can see uh, very reminiscent of the um, Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C., if you've ever been there, but there these black granite slabs with names etched on it. And what their goal is, is to have every name of every person who died during the Battle of Okinawa, whether military, U.S. military, um, 
They have 14,000 U.S. names up there. They have over 100,000 Japanese military names. They have at least 125,000 Okinawa names. They also have Koreans, Chinese, uh, Australians. Yeah, and Are there foreign soldiers? Yeah, each one has a, a section. So there's yeah. the Japanese section, there's the Okinawa Japanese military, Okinawa civilian section. There's the U.S. section, there's a little section for Australia, a little section for Great Britain. There's like maybe a dozen on that one. Um, and they leave empty spaces because they're still trying to discover names. Uh, it's an ongoing process. But it is huge. Like, uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's about, um, it wouldn't fit inside the whole library. And it's interesting, too, because um, our guide pointed out that uh, on one of the U.S. stones, there's the name of this one person. They don't put any rank, but he said, so this is the highest ranking U.S. Uh, military officer ever killed in battle during World War II. Um, mm -hmm. He was an admiral or a general. Mm -hmm. um, and he's just listed alphabetically with everybody else. Mm -hmm. And then they have another one in the Japanese section who was the commander of Japanese forces on Okinawa, mm -hmm. who a lot of people considered to be like a butcher. Because mm -hmm. he forced a lot of Okinawa and civilians to stay where they were and keep working rather than letting them leave. And so that's why they got, all got killed. Mm -hmm. uh, and he also ordered his men to not surrender and you know, commit suicide before mm -hmm. he surrendered. So a lot of people consider him to be a, a war criminal. Um, but he's just listed as one of the names without rank. Because um, the prefectural focus was, so this is a memorial to peace and remembrance, mm -hmm. and it's not to lay blame on one side or the other uh, for starting the war, for ending the war, for being innocent victims, for being perpetrators. Now we just want to acknowledge mm -hmm. that basically that war is bad, mm -hmm. and, and all these people died because of it. And then you can see in the background that tower, that's the actual museum where they have exhibits uh, and artifacts from the battle, uh, including some like skulls of a lot of um, both soldiers and civilians hid in caves um, on the island, and a lot of them died there. So they have recreations of some of those caves and what the conditions were like, which were frankly really bad. Yeah, I think that um, for the delegation, I think having more of this history and background was really helpful to understanding this really long-standing peace movement that Okinawans have such a high value on. Um, you know, so their opposition to building any new base is definitely rooted in, we remember, you know, we, we know, we've already been through this scale of destruction. And today, the possibilities, obviously, are even greater because the destructive power of existing weapons now are ever more deadly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it isn't only that they went through the experience and, and uh, they don't want those memories resurrected. It's also by having, US has a lot of US uh, military bases in Japan, but 70% of U.S. bases in Japan are in Okinawa, which is only 1% of the, of the Japanese land mass. So it's like 1% of Japan contains 70% of U.S. military bases, which means if there ever is a shooting war, mm -hmm. Okinawa is going to be the first target in Japan for anybody who's fighting the U.S. So it puts them at great risk having all that stuff like that. And the, the value that the U.S. military puts on those installations is um, every war you can think of um, that's the launch point you know so if you think kind of geographically well Afghanistan you know and, and then going all the way back um, okay so I know this seems like what kind of a transition could this be <laughs> but I um, couldn't resist putting it in because you just blue seal ice cream was kind of all around and yes I did have some yes, it, was, woo, it was really good 
how come I can't buy that here? Okay, I know, I know, globalization. But, but anyway, <laughs> um, so apparently their slogan is this idea, you know, born in America, raised in Okinawa, and the story that we were told is that the U.S. soldiers really missed their dairy products, including ice cream. And so the first blue seal factory was on a base. The workers in that factory were, you already know, Okinawan, but they weren't allowed to eat it because not for them. You're just a worker, you know? So then it becomes contraband material, you know, to, you know, like, no. You, so it's not until years later, um, 1963, so kind of think about it. Okay, not that ice cream is so important. <laughs> okay, really, I, yeah, I, it's just a symbol of all of this. But then it becomes available, and now you can see little franchises, you know, and then you can just sort of walk in, you, the consumer, in this case, us kind of tourist delegates. Um, under Okinawan ownership, um, a lot has been done with some really, um, you know, local flavors, and so we were really pleased to experience, you know, the emo, mm, really good. Um, and then one article I was looking at, just to make sure I had my facts okay on Lucille, did talk about how, um, on, on the other hand, local Okinawans seem to prefer American flavors, which I don't know if you have any stereotypes about what you think American flavors would be, but I thought, well, that's interesting. I don't know what the documentation is on that. Tracy? Mm -hmm. So was there anything significant about 1963 in Okinawa that brought this about? Um, <laughs> I don't, I didn't look into that part. Uh, I think what, what I thought was kind of interesting is that it really took some time. I mean, you're looking at, you know, over a decade. Now, whether it's because business development, um, I don't know if there's, you know, in the 1960s, we're beginning to see a whole variety of civil rights protests, not only here in the United States, you're probably familiar with that, but in other places. Um, young people, students in particular, just really, um, you know, wanting to see uh, change in the world, you know, a better, more equal kind of society. And, you know, for Okinawa, there's all those contradictions there. So maybe that had a little bit to do with it. I don't know if it contributed to that, but in 63 is when we started building up our military presence and getting ready to launch war in Vietnam. Yeah. And so the military, the numbers of military based in Okinawa uh, started growing around that time. That's true. Um, because Okinawa was a launch point right. for uh, air flights, bombing raids to yeah. go over Vietnam, as well as a staging area for Marines and other troops. Um, we would stop there before we got shipped into Vietnam. I think Asian American activists um, who, who were very concerned and opposing the Vietnam War were really inspired by the um, nonviolent protests um, to try to stop or slow the building of some of these bases. I can remember reading about that. So um, it was actually foremost dairy that went in mm -hmm. to start the first ice cream factory in yeah. Okinawa. And apparently their containers uh, all had a blue seal on them, and that's how they got the name. Uh, when it got transferred, because well, because Okinawans couldn't read English at that point, right? But they could see the color and they said, "Oh, that's blue seal ice cream." Mm -hmm. So, okay, Ospreys. I think this is the largest number I've ever seen ever, other than just like pictures from AP or something. And I'm um, pretty sure this is for Tenma, you know, because we stood um, on a park that looked down on this particular base. This is especially controversial because um, since 1995, it's been promised to be moved, but the controversy then is moved where? And US Marines have claimed that, well, the only place acceptable to us, I'm channeling the Marines, the only place acceptable to us is Hanako area, uh, and, um, you know, when we were viewing them, I felt like there was something like, didn't our guide say there was 24 lined up? It was just a really large number. And if you're wondering, well, so what, so what, who cares about Osprey? Other than Boeing, okay, Boeing has had a hand in all this, 
but it's the kind of jet that has the capacity of um, vertical lift off. So, but so, it, and it was all developed, um, I think, in response to um, in, not so much in in Okinawa, but other other military interventions that the U.S. was engaged in, where the U.S. military said we have to have a new kind of um, plane that can be both a helicopter but also have a high speed. Um, so if, if that is uh, you know, if you're wondering what that is. But it's, uh, but you know, they, they've had accidents and the location of this is like near schools and it's kind of right in the middle of a lot of other residential and work sites and so um, hopefully you're not having to live really near a current air base but you know, um, we, we were all really concerned when we heard that. Yeah. Well, if you look at the photo, yeah. and you can see buildings on this side of uh, the Aeros Airport and buildings on the other side. Um, we visited an elementary school, which was right against the green zone. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they have the, the airfield, and then they have a buffer zone uh, that's a green zone with trees and grass. Mm -hmm. And then there's the fence. chain link fence with the barbed wire at the top. And like that chain link fence was the back side of the elementary school. Mm -hmm. And the elementary school had, had built bunkers um, because one of the ospreys had lost a door when it was coming in, and the door dropped in the play field of the elementary school. Mm -hmm. So now they have uh, bunkers with these like concrete roofs that are about a foot thick uh, on either side of the play field and it, it, when they give the signal um, all the kids run into those bunkers so that they don't get hit and killed by dropping parts from U.S. aircraft. Okay, um, so this is um, to show all the different U.S. military units um, it's color coded, and I guess it might be a little hard to read from the very back. Um, but Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force, and then um, the the water part. So yeah, water part. That's called the training areas. So then they kind of, you know, then if you're a civilian, you're not supposed to uh, be in the place where the training is going on. But um, there's lots of words, so we talked about Futenma, and that's right here, so Futenma Air Station, right here. Um, but, uh, and then the place we're going to talk about, Henoko, is up here, and Gura Bay. But um, others, of, uh, others of these, you, if you have any friends who have served abroad, they've probably been through here. Camp Schwab, Camp Hansen, all widely known, very historical. <laughs> currently in use, um, all of that. Um, so I think this kind of helps visualize why it feels very impressive. Okay, this is that bigger kind of a picture. So I was trying to get something that could help us understand base, US bases um, and deployments in the Asia Pacific region. Um, so I'm not going to try to explain all of this. Um, the sources include US State Department military talks. I didn't put this together. I wish I were that clever. It's put together by something called Geopolitical Futures. Um, but it's um, just to kind of help remind so that if we're looking at um, Okinawa down here, um, you know, Japan is, and I'm not, oh wait, I should be using the little red pointer. <laughs> red? It, the red Oops. <laughs> oh, okay. Oops. And now we're starting all over again. I'm teasing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was going to try to use our, anyway, um, we don't even have to spend a whole lot more time on it. Um, but I just thought that was kind of, you know, so when people talk about um, militarization, or maybe you've been reading about, you know, some people, um, oh, current administration, want to contain militarily China. So that means building up throughout the area so that they can have options. You know, so that's Okinawa right there, right? So see how close it is to Taiwan and this is China here. Uh, Kadena Air Base is closer to Taiwan than it is to Tokyo. 
and it's actually closer to the Philippines than it is to the northern part of Japan. So being central, and if there's going to be a military confrontation with China, that's kind of like right in the middle. Um, we probably have more bases down here, but it's kind of like U.S. forces are stationed around here, east in China. So, yeah. Um, and then this uh, kind of this, I don't know, what do we call it, tan color, is collective defense arrangement with the United States. And you may or may not be aware that Thailand is participating in that. It's hard to keep track of so many developments. OK. Um, I think this stood out to us a lot because um, our, our host took us out on a, I've never been, on a glass bottom boat. So there's glass so you can just really like look down, those of us who are not smart enough to know how to scuba dive and so on. Um, so they took us around um, Ura Bay, which is right there, the Henoko region, which is where this new build, well, they have already started. Um, there's been delays, but there is, they are attempting to do the groundwork for this base um, at Hinoko for the Marines, U.S. Marines. And so um, going out in that boat was for us to be reminded of um, the fragility of um, the ocean environment, the uniqueness of this particular bay, uh, to be reminded that if you really do want to protect the biodiversity, so I had the uh, dugong in there, because that, you know, it's not like, well, they can just live somewhere else. Come on now, you know, and that's just not, you know, some of you are laughing at me, you're like, I am a science student, I could tell you, tell you a whole lot. Yeah, species. Yeah, so, and, and you know, so um, that really reminds, so part of their co coalition, which I really admire, they have what's called the All Okinawa Coalition, and it was such an inspiring model because I've often dreamed of such, what, what would it take? What would that look like for us in this state or in this nation? Because so many different kinds of groups coming together. So the environmentalists were really big on this and we'll take a really quick look at some of their really unique protests. I mean, have you ever thought about a sit-in wearing your scuba gear? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and their boats, the floating sit-ins. You know, I mean, I know Greenpeace and, okay, there's a few little actions out there in Puget Sound. But, um, so you have environmentalists, you have mothers, you have students, you have labor activists, you have people who are elected. The governor of the prefecture is right in this coalition. We got to meet with him. Yeah, so, I don't know, other, other thoughts on that? So, Ora Bay, so Hinoko is like a peninsula. It comes out to a point. On one side, it's, it's pretty shallow, but on the other side is Ora Bay that um, is, goes pretty deep and then comes up, and then there's all these coral reefs that you see on the right. And there's over 5,000 species identified living in those coral reefs. Um, by comparison, the, there's a uh, National Maritime Wildlife Refuge that was created, Obama created it, I don't know if the council's not been in it yet, yeah. um, in the Pacific around Hawaii. And it's like 10 times the size, and that area contains over 7,000 identified species. So something about a tenth of that size has about 5,000 species. So it's really a diverse, rich area. Um, and what they found out, um, the whole base building thing doesn't doesn't make sense economically. It doesn't make sense geographically um, and geologically, uh, and it certainly doesn't make sense socially or politically, and certainly not morally. But uh, geologically, um, at the point on one side, it's it's fairly shallow, to, and they have to do a lot of fill in order to get a flat area that you can land mm -hmm. those planes on, right? And on one side, it's pretty shallow, so it's not hard to fill that in and get it even with the land area. But on the other side, it goes down to almost 200 feet fairly quickly. And uh, so that's a, a lot of landfill that you have to do. And how are you going to support it? Because it can't just be, it's got to be solid. You know, you can't be running planes and landing them on something that's going to, you know, ripple every time you hit. 
so it's got to be really solid. But what they also found out is that the bottom, at the bottom of that 200 foot drop, is they said it's the consistency of cottage cheese. So, um, so they're not sure how deep they have to go mm -hmm. below the surface to actually get something stable. And so the plan is to put in something like 50,000 post pillars. Um, and, and there's no guarantee that that'll work. So it just yeah. it doesn't really make sense. Plus, so that's going to take a lot of time. It, it originally said we could do this in three years. Now they're saying, well, maybe we can do it in 10 years. <laughs> um, and the cost goes up exponentially as well. So economically, geologically, and not to mention morally, it's, it's just totally different. Um, so that coalition, and um, they actually formed with this name in 2014, but our hosts were also quick to point out that this long history of nonviolent protest has, goes so many, so many more decades back. Um, but uh, in November 2015, they came and um, you know to speak with uh, members of Congress, whoever they could gain audience with, and then they also had their picture taken um, with their banner, which if you can't quite read it, it's uh, Okinawa says no, um, a new military base at Henoko. Um, so, uh, and, and I think um, earlier that summer of 2015 is when their delegation first came to a policy convention. Um, let's see, if I can make it work, it's a little YouTube, just as an example, we'll see who we think. Oh, oh, I said I'll blast them away. So even when our boat was just kind of touring the area, we were shadowed by two different boats, you know, because, hey, they might be protesters. Uh-oh, mm -hmm. worse, it's foreigners, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, then I just had um, this, uh, they, they were for a time doing kind of flotillas as well as divers to uh, try to, um, you know, dramatize um, what's happening in our day. Um, yeah, and so that whole, mm -hmm. whole Henoko Peninsula where they're doing the landfill is surrounded by this big boom. Um, just the floating things that are about balls, about this size diameter that are strung together on chains. And um, I think those were largely put there to keep these folks out. Because 
the kayakivists would go out there in the kayaks and try to disrupt things. And then they have what's equivalent to the Japanese Coast Guard and patrol boats. They're stationed about every couple hundred yards. So as our boat went, we kind of followed the contour of the peninsula. One boat, the Coast Guard boat, would come and would shadow us. And then when it got to a certain point, it would go back to its original position and the next boat would come and shadow us. Um, and if we got too close, then they'd start yelling on the boat on that we're in violation of space and we had to get out. So uh, in case you at this point might be wondering, wow, that's a lot of information to take in. Is there anything, me sitting here in Seattle Central Library, anything that I might be able to do? And so I'm just passing along what our host suggests. I wanted to point out that, in fact, um, our um, Adam Smith is, even if you're not uh, living in Districts 9, he is still representing the state of Washington, and you are here in the state of Washington. The key thing is that he happens to chair the Armed Services Committee, um, and he has to document any, not any kind of uh, constituency, that's all of us, any communication with him. He has to log it in. They're just obligated to. That's, it goes into kind of public record. So if you felt like just sending him a little message, and he has a little form, mm -hmm. I know you can't quite click on this, but it's adamsmith.house.gov slash forward slash contact. It's a little form. And you can just say, I'm very disturbed. <laughs> or, I really think this is a bad idea. Or, save or obey. Or, you know, any number of things. Whatever, whatever felt like, I think he needs to hear from me and know that I am here at Seattle Central College and want you to pay attention. Um, I think that our host would be very, very appreciative. Um, when following our visit, they came in November because they were bringing their case before the United Nations. And so one of our delegates uh, is a, an appointee for the union called Unite Here, which is actually uh, hospitality workers. Anyway, so they were able to arrange um, so a meeting that was very well attended by some of the staff from different United Nations departments, but just other people who wanted to know more about it. And I think they felt that that was pretty productive. Then they went on to Washington, D.C., where they tried to get appointments with different key individuals. I don't think they met with Congressman Smith, but you, you said right about Orabe, not Hanalo. You, you could just say Henneco. You Hanico. could just, you could make it general. Reduce the bases in Okinawa. Wow, that would be quite amazing. And, and well, the well, specific yeah. thing is the base at Hanoko. And Save Over a Bay is a bay on uh, the north side of Hanoko. <laughs> oh, it, uh, it's O U R A, Ora. We're probably not saying it quite right. Ora Bay. Uh, and it just so happens that Adam Smith is holding a town hall. In Tukwila oh. this Saturday, January 25th, this Saturday. at 11 a.m. Hmm, you just happen to be there. Is that the uh, Teamster Local 174? Oh, isn't that interesting? What weapon is it Saturday? Saturday, January 25th, from 11 to 1. What did you say that was supposed to say? <laughs> Sorry. Right, we could write it up. We Please. Sandy, you could write it up there. Yeah, there's a little bit of a we're planning to actively be there. <laughs> Well, and even if you can't go to one of those town halls, that's another, you know, you could say, I, uh, although I can't be present at this town hall, I would like to bring this concern up. Please reply. <laughs> you don't even have to explain lots of things. I, I mean, I think, you know, they, they're, Congress people get lots of different communications, um, but maybe not so much on this particular base. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't leave you being as we are in a library. If I did not leave you with a few suggestions, if you just, you know, you heard a few things and you wonder, well, now wait a minute, what else is written about this? And, you know, we are two delegates that were part of, it's a small delegation, seven of us. Um, I've read all of Akemi Johnson's book, 
and was thrilled to discover that several of the women that she includes um, as activists in her collection, were, they were part of our hosts. And I, I had no idea just how, um, well, I had no idea. I, I was so grateful the exchanges I had with them, but I had no idea about all the other roles that they played. Um, I appreciated their focus because the effects um, on women, particularly, of having such a high concentration of uh, military um, bases and soldiers, male soldiers, um, has you know been part of the, the enormous friction because uh, even within the last year, there's been um, attacks on Okinawan women and um, and, and the perpetrators. So, um, and, and it goes really far back. So that book I really appreciated. Um, Resistant Islands is a little bit more like an anthology. Um, it's, it is really good. I haven't made it all the way through it, but definitely appreciative of all the things that I learned. And if you're more literary, um, this professor, Davinder Balmit, I'm not sure I'm saying her name right. She's actually at University of Washington. Wow. So you could go take a class with her when you transfer. This is one of her kind of newer collections, and um, Alex Hing had read that. He said it's just, it's, it's extraordinary. It's a really uh, beautiful book of writings. Um, we brought other things that you can take a look at. We were unable to make copies, but I guess if you're like, I just really have a personal copy, you could leave an email with us, and maybe you can figure out a way to scan it. Um, maybe there's questions. We're happy to stay if you're like, I've got to go to my one o'clock class. Um, yeah, we're happy to entertain any questions. Too. I'm just, I'm here with Seattle Bleed, and I'm just curious if I can oh. take a quick picture of you two. Oh, okay, you. sure. It's just on my phone, but okay. we're just going to be posting. Okay. So. Okay. I'm also here with the collision. Oh, my God. <laughs> 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 Media in the house. Well, let's go with full disclosure. Yeah. 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 It's not the, not, not the major, sorry, but take away from the floor. Perfect. One more. Thank you. Nice. It's really high tech. <laughs> so if I could have your all your permissions yeah. and Tracy, I could I saw folks taking pictures of some of the slides. Yeah. Um, we have a cozy lip guide on the library's page, oh. and if it's if it's okay with you all, I could post parts or all of yeah. this, and then that way folks can reference it and get the direct link to um, Adam Smith. That, that would be super handy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, you know, you you answered some of this, you know, in your presentation, but I think it's just like so hard for people to live, you know, in the same space with, you know, murderers, you know, like who yes. basically killed, you know, their families and you know the generations before that, and I think the impacts, you know, like different age groups, you know, different like you know young and old people, women and men, you know, or like you know non-binary, you know, people like it's just. And I was wondering if you had like personal conversations, you know, with like some people who live there, and you know what they thought about living in such an environment. Well, I mean, I most of our interactions were with our folks, and so they had, you know, pretty strong opinions. Um, admittedly, the host committee was um, people of a certain generation, so not the youngest, but we did spend a day at one of the universities where we actually um, had small group discussions with students who are not so different than you, but they weren't talking so much to this topic. They were. Um, they were actually, we were partly there uh, because that university is considering forming a labor center, and so the students were kind of in conversations about, huh, you know, academically, what would that mean? So um, anyway, th thank you for that. It's a really good question, though. I, I don't know if you have other thoughts you want to offer. Well, one of the things, um, we visited a couple of elementary schools and uh, uh, a museum, art museum, uh, and stopped at a university uh, well, where we talked with students. Uh, one of the things that, that struck me that they were concerned about at the elementary school is talking about some of the teachers and principals, is that, because uh, that's one where they had the bunkers, and I was saying, wow, that must be really scary for the kids. So I said, well, that's one of the things that we're concerned about because for most of the kids it is very scary because uh, when the jets take off it like rattles the windows and you can't hear the teacher anymore. 
and then when they got on the playground, the whistle or the siren goes off, everyone's got to scatter and get out of those bunkers. But what I mean, they were saying is that what's disturbing is that there's uh, a number of kids who are used to it. Like, it's like, normalized. That's, that's normal. So they don't get scared or upset or, or freaked out. Because, oh yeah, I'm going to go run in the bunker. Oh yeah, another plane park dropped on the, the play field. And, and oh yeah, there's you know hundreds of US military running around in the shopping mall there. Um, and, and the whole idea that this kind of militarized way of life is, is kind of like the kids are getting used to um, seeing that as normal because they never live under anything else. And it's also difficult because especially here's these you know students who are trying to imagine like you know settle on a major and degree and, and imagine a life after being a student and if the context is largely militarized then hey then are the best jobs connected to more militarization? That's a question mark. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, the other faculty that we spoke with and other um, just, you know, members of the community, they said, why can't we envision at Okinawa where the jobs and the economy and so on isn't so tilted that way? Why can't, why can't we have that possibility because it, it was really distressing to think that, you know, this is our future. It's tied to the, oh, the U.S. cannot leave because our future is with that. Whoa! You know, failure of imagination. Huge failure of imagination. But how did it get there? And, um, well, that's a big question. I mean, I, I don't think we're so different here. It's just, like, we framed a little differently. Hmm, what if the Trident wasn't stationed? right there across the water. Hmm, you know, what are the other air, I mean, you know, it's like, oh, look at life differently. So I just want us to thank our presenters. <laughs> if you have any other questions, Tracy mentioned that she has a little bit of time, I'm not sure if Stan yeah, does, yeah. Uh, but feel free to stay and talk to them. Um, and thank you for your presence. I will take your surveys as you walk out. And